All right. So, ladies and gents, students, I am here with a special guest. This is Mr. Matt Withrow, who works for Adidas, but also a D230 uh, alum, pretty stud in the running world as well. But, Matt, thank you so much for being here and joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate uh, being able to, you know, have a conversation and talk to some, some D230 kids and, uh, yeah, share a little of my experience. Absolutely. So first of all, I think I'd love to just start right off the bat with, uh, I know that, you know, I saw on LinkedIn and that you work for Adidas. Could you explain kind of what your job with Adidas is and maybe what it looks like in, in an average day for you? And, and we could maybe go from there. Sounds good. Yeah. So my, my official title is a key account manager. And basically what that means is I am in charge of uh, the sales side of the Adidas business selling into one of our key partners and retailers. So my specific account actually is Foot Locker Inc. So for a lot of people don't know, know this, but like Foot Locker Inc. actually owns a lot of different um, different individual stores and banners. So there's Foot Locker, Foot, Foot Action, Kids Foot Locker, and then there's Champs and East Bay. So my particular part of the business is the Champs and East Bay side. Um, and I focus a lot on the East Bay side as well, which is more like the sport and, and my personal background. Um, but from a key account manager is basically the liaison between the company, Adidas, and the vendor and the, the retailer, in this instance, East Bay. And it's a lot of people hear the word sales and think of like, you know, you're, you're, all you're doing is just trying to like sell in as much as you possibly can of your goods to a certain, uh, a certain retailer, a certain account, regardless what it is. What my business is more as an account manager is to kind of keep the health of the business going. And when I say that is, it's basically more um, back-end work. And when I say back-end, I mean like watching where orders are, where they're going, um, being really in charge of taking the key stories that we are, are selling and, and tying it in with the marketing teams and being the liaison between our marketing teams and their marketing teams. Um, and there's just kind of all this kind of like in-between type work. And a lot of people have always talked about like sales, there's inside sales and outside sales, but nowadays there's kind of like account management where you have an account and that's, that's all you're selling into and you're trying to just grow in the business or make the business healthy at that account. And then the other side of sales a lot is like, you're going out and you're prospecting and you're finding new accounts, you're finding new places to sell your goods in. Mine is much more what I would call like the relational side. Um, my day to day, uh, now nah, I'll say pre, pre COVID, um, my account used to be in Wausau, Wisconsin. It's actually now in, in uh, Southern Florida in the Tampa Bay area. But when I was in Wausau, Wisconsin, uh, this was actually right before COVID, I'd be up there probably like every other week, um, maybe three, every three weeks or so, and having a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. A big part of my job is keeping a relational side. So my counterparts at the, um, at the account are what are called buyers, and they're the ones who buy and manage the lines of what they're actually going to bring in and sell at their, their individual stores. And... That's, that's the majority of, of kind of like the face-to-face -face stuff. We had an office. We had an office downtown on Kinsey. Uh, we decided actually to close it because it was just a regional office. A lot of, a lot of uh, companies during COVID looked at, you know, overhead and what they needed to do and stuff. And technology like Zoom and things are allowing us to have all the face-to-face -face stuff differently. I actually have not been to my account in about... 18 months now, almost, almost 20 months. So everything we've been able to do just over Zoom. So it's a lot of systems and, and, and conversations kind of like this and going over, you know, order books and management uh, along those lines. Um, so that's kind of how it morphed into with, with COVID. I think once these restrictions get a little bit looser, I'll be down in Florida, probably not as often as I was in Wausau, I'll probably down there about once a month. And then we have a, our North American headquarters, um, a little bit about Adidas. Adidas is a German company, actually, and they're based just outside of Nuremberg. That's our global headquarters. But our North American headquarters are in Portland, Oregon, which is a huge hub for this industry, the footwear and apparel industry. I mean, that's where Nike's based. There's all sorts of accounts that are out there now. Um, so we have a regional, we have a North American office there. And then we have like a regional sales office actually in New York City because the headquarters of Foot Locker Inc. is in New York City. So I'm in an interesting spot being able to still live in Chicago and I'll, I'll do a lot of commuting between now Southern Florida, New York and, and Portland. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of my normal day to day now in terms of where, where we are post COVID. Interesting. So if Adidas like is you're working with shoe and apparel then 
through the Foot Locker Inc. If there's like a new shoe that's coming out in that, does that affect you and your relationship with the buyer? Like, are you relaying that information and trying to like anticipate how many orders they would need in different stores in Florida? Is that something that you would like work with? Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, that's actually a, a great way of kind of explaining it. So like the big word I would say is forecast. Like the majority of my business is forecasting what the account is going to do, forecasting what is going to sell through with the account, what we're going to need to return that doesn't sell through, all these different things. So within my world, and I would say it's pretty similar for any, I'll say any tangible good that someone is going to sell um, or it's just going to be in the marketplace. You have a, a, a vendor um, and you have some sort of account or retailer on that side. And on the vendor side, everything starts with product creation. And then it goes into, in our world, what do we call merchandisers and product managers. And then once from there, they hand it off to the sales teams to implement it into their individual retailers. So I'm kind of like the third check-in point, I'll say, as a new shoe comes to market. Uh, I'll talk about a shoe that probably a lot of uh, your students know, and that's Kanye West Yeezy. That is my number one seller. Uh, we just had a launch the other day. We sold 26,000 pairs in about four hours. So we're still absolutely smoking with that shoe. But that shoe first came to life with, with product development and our relationship with Kanye West. And they kind of developed and thought about this shoe and what they wanted to look like. And then once it goes to the merchandising teams, the merchandising teams decide, okay, how am I going to bring this to life um, in, in my particular region? And our merchandisers are in charge of North America. Their job is very similar to mine in terms of they're looking at a very wide market, a multiple amount of accounts in terms of how they want the shoe to come to life, how many units they want it to be in the marketplace, what they foresee they can sell through, what are any hurdles, marketing, all those types of things. Then once it gets passed off to me, I further that vision of how the shoe is going to come to life, and I'm doing it just in my particular lane at my account. So Full Locker is our number one global partner. Um, so they're, they're, they're number one priority of any account that we have across the, across the world. Um, but then counterparts for me, we have people at like Finish Line and then like Nordstrom's. So we've got probably about, I'd say about 20, maybe 25 key account managers um, in, in our company. Um, and then below that, there's all sorts of different like sales reps that will work with smaller accounts. Um, but for like the really key accounts, like that's, that's kind of their job is figuring out, okay, here's the line. What makes sense from the line for me to bring into my particular account? And, and you know, how do I bring that to life? So with that, are you also working with other people from Adidas in order to be, say, I have this need in Florida and I need help with marketing? Do you bring in other teams as well and are you, like bridge that gap in relationship between your mm -hmm. client and Adidas? Yeah, no, def definitely. And that's kind of like that, that word liaison that I use. Um, it's, I'm a, li I'm a larger account now. Um, so there's, I'll say there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Uh, sure. Sometimes we're a type of account where if they don't like something they're doing, they can go way over my head to <laughs> pick up the phone and, and talk to the CEO at some times to say, hey, this is, this is what we want. But my position, yes. Yeah. So on, on our side, um, we have product creation. Those, those guys are pretty removed from the actual account, but the, the touch points with the account would be our marketing team. So what we would call um, trade marketing. And trade marketing would be the, the folks who would work on a lot of things like in-store um, uh, campaigns and things that we're going to do. We have a whole separate digital side of the business now, too, so the digital marketing. East Bay, in particular, is solely a digital account, um, although they did open their first brick-and-mortar store in, in the world, actually, in Oak Brook, which is pretty cool because it was a partnership with, with Champs. Um, but for, for that side, I'm 100% I'm a, I'm a on the digital with the digital team. So that's really important. And then we have a whole other team called like Concept to Consumer. And, and they're basically like my part, my everyday working partner in terms of working with um, what we would call the business units. The business units are the um, parts of the business for like, we have a running business unit. We have a basketball business unit, a training business unit. We actually have a Yeezy business unit just due to the fact of how big and successful that, that is. So they, um, they're kind of my counterpart. They sit in Portland at our headquarters um, and they'll kind of funnel a lot of stuff through me that I can get to the account. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of, lot, of different, um, a lot of different folks, especially on the digital side, because there's so many uh, moving components to that. There's so much copy that has to be written for every shoot. Like every time you click on, a, on an item that you're trying to buy online and you get to what we would call a landing page for that, um, for that particular item, 
everything that you see on there from the digital imagery to all the descriptions to everything involved in it, that's all has to come from us and we have to provide that. There's a huge business section of, uh, of, of our, our, um, our industry that just focuses on that, especially with accounts like Amazon where it's, you know, that's, that's about a 20 person team in terms of like all of that work that has to go. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of my job is kind of getting, either getting the answer myself or going to where, you know, putting two people together um, to, to, to get an answer figured out. That does sound like a lot of cooks in the kitchen um, and a lot of communication. Uh, can I ask then, is this, is sales, I know that you were, uh, you know, and are a fantastic runner and were very successful. Uh, was sales something that naturally you fell into or is it something you sought after or was it more like being a part of a specific company and then becoming that? Could you kind of talk about your path on how you ended up in this position? I think a lot of students like to see and walk through someone else's shoes of how they got to where they are. Yeah, um, I'm definitely a, uh, an interesting uh, kind of story of how, how I got here. Um, my initial plan was actually to be sitting where you're sitting and I was went to school to be, to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, I mean, before I kind of get into my backstory, I will say uh, when I first started working at Adidas, I've been with the company just over 10 years now. And there was maybe one or two guys who either, at least in the running department, I started in specifically with the running department. I sold in stores like um, like Human Race Sports on, on LaGrange there was one of my accounts, like real small mom and pop uh, shoe stores. Um, but especially on the running side and in the sales side, when I first started, you everybody that worked sans maybe one or two people for us either was a very competitive runner or had retail background that worked at like one of those mom and pop stores. I, I actually was lucky enough to, to have both of those experiences. Right now, I'm the anomaly. I mean, half the guys I work with are from what we call CPG sales, consumer packaged goods. Like they come from Coke and Pepsi and uh, okay. Kellogg's and all that kind of kind of stuff. So the world has changed a lot. Like we used to be, there's a term in our, our, our industry called shoe dogs. It's actually a really good book, shoe dog. It's about Bill Knight, who um, is the uh, was the founder of, of Nike. But there was all these guys who just just came up like loving the product, loving everything about running, loving everything about maybe basketball or something, whatever your particular lane was. Um, but like now it's just, you just are good business. A lot of, a lot of it's just good business people. But like my, um, my particular background, uh, like I said, I was, I, I ran um, and I was pretty successful in high school and college and actually was able to run a little bit after. And when I was in um, high school, my, my, almost my first job, actually my first job was a caddy at Crystal Tree, but my second job was um, working at Running for Kicks in Palos Heights, and that was a, a running shoe store. So I worked there all the way through high school, a lot of times summers in college, and then when I started living, I went to school in Madison and University of Wisconsin. When I was living there longer, I started working at another shoe store up, up there. So I was a shoe dog. I loved everything about, about running shoes and, and track spikes and all that stuff. Like, I loved sitting down with like the account reps when they would come into our stores and sell us in a product. Like I knew all that kind of stuff back, like the back of my hand. So when I was at Wisconsin, we actually were sponsored. We were one of the key schools to be sponsored by Adidas. And when I was there um, on campus, on any campus, like at Oregon with their partnership with Nike, um, at Notre Dame with their partnership with Under Armour, there's a liaison, again, kind of a similar to what I do now. There's a liaison who is at the college who basically does all the ordering and planning and stuff for all the gear and, and, and things that uh, the players and coaches and, and bookstores and everything and whatnot need. So I got to know that person really well when I was at Adidas and I, or when I was at Wisconsin. Um, and I actually used to do a lot of the ordering and the sizing and fitting and stuff for our entire track team when I was, when I was there, uh, just cause I knew the product so well and I knew the line and, and it was easier for me to do it rather than, you know, some, somebody who would just talk to our coaches and our coaches gave had a lot of trust in me to be able to do that. So when I got out of college, I tried to run, you know, quote unquote professionally for a little bit. And I, I was lucky enough to keep my relationship with Adidas. And I ran for a team that was sponsored by Adidas. And I got to know just a lot more people at the company because of that. And when I was, when I stopped running, um, 2000, 2009, 2010, uh, I reached out to Adidas and just said like, you know, is there any openings? Is there anything that, that we can do? And at that time, a, what we call uh, like tech reps, um, technical representatives, um, that was, this was a part of the company that was just kind of kicking off again. And what those people are, um, 
they're kind of glorified. If you ever see those guys driving around in like the Red Bull vans and passing yeah. out Red Bull and hyping it up and everything, that was like half of my job was like just promoting the, the, the company. Yeah. And my, the other half of my job was um, working with small mom and pop stores on, stores on doing events and merchandising. Like we did do stuff in like Chicago Marathon, all that. And I actually went down to Texas to do that. So I was in, I was in Dallas. Um, and then from there, just kind of progressed through a couple of different roles. I was able to move back to Chicago, move back home. And for a while, I was a regional uh, manager for like mom and pop shops. I went a lot of wheel time. I mean, my territory was from the Dakotas all the way to Wisconsin, all the way to Southern Illinois. Uh, so all over the place, had about a hundred accounts and just, you know, was in the accounts all the time, you know, doing my sales stuff, doing event things too. Like I still had a couple of tech reps, but it was just a big territory. And then I started working um, as a, what we would call a key account rep, which we don't really have too many of those anymore. And that was doing my same job, just a smaller account uh, called Shields. It's a, a pretty large sporting goods store. There's about 28, 29 locations in, in the middle part of the country and West. And then I uh, was lucky enough to move over to the Foot Inc. business. Um, I'd always want to work on East Bay. Um, when from the point I started working at Adidas, like East Bay was to me like the biggest thing in sport. I mean, um, yeah, you have to exporting goods and stuff, and that that was that's a lot of fun. But like East Bay only tells top end stories. Like they're only telling the best of the best. And I, I really, really kind of was drawn to that because a lot of times when I was in high school, um, that was one of the few places you can get like really high end track and fields lights and things mm. like that. I'm sure you remember when we were younger getting the East Bay catalog at home. Like everybody yeah. loved that. The volleyball thing. shoes for me. Oh yeah. 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 I was going to say, I know. Yeah. My older brother, you know, I remember him too. They all, they would get volleyballs from there. Cause it's, that's a great example. Like they brought at the time I would call that a niche sport. And you know, the early two thousands, late nineties, like that was a pretty niche sport that you couldn't go into a sports authority or a six sporting goods or you know, galleons or whatever it was called at that time. Um, and buy those things. And like, that's really what East Bay was able to do. And I thought that was, that was so cool. And um, it, it was kind of a full circle moment for me. Cause when I was in high school, um, I actually, uh, the national championship races for high school was called Foot Locker National Championships. Foot Locker and East Bay in partnership ran, ran that meet to the point where it's so recognizable. Um, people just call it Foot Locker. They don't call it nationals. Like everybody just knows what Foot Locker is. So it was kind of cool for me to be able to work on that side of the business after at that point, she's 15, almost 15 years after uh, I had won that race. So like for me, that was, that was, that was a really, really cool thing. And for the last yeah, almost four years now, I've worked in one capacity or another within the, uh, the Foot Locker Inc. group. Wow, that's great. So you, you had a lot of opportunities for growth within one place, uh, mm -hmm. which is great to think about. And I think a lot of students think about getting to the job. But once you're at a job, it's also nice to think about, are there places to grow and go from there? So thank you for bringing that up. I want to be cognizant of your time. One last thing then, and I really appreciate all that you've said so far. Are there any tips or skills or anything over the years now that you thought about that you wish you would have known or just something that's really helped and benefited you that our students can learn from? Yeah, um, I'd say one thing uh, that's really important, I mean, especially nowadays, uh, when you're trying to get a new job or you're trying to you know, get a promotion or something like that, at some point you're sitting in an interview you have a skill set. Everyone has a skill set. Everyone has experience. One of the most important things is being able to actually articulate that. Um, and that's a hard thing. It's, it's very, you know, myself included. Like, I have a hard time talking about, like, one, my accomplishments. Nobody really. That's kind of an uncomfortable thing to talk about sometimes. And two, like, really getting across what your skill set is and what you're good at and what your experiences are. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was um, if you ever work on a project or you ever work on, you know, you accomplish something, whether in job or outside your job, I mean, community work, anything like that, like write a short, brief statement of what you did in terms of like throw it on your phone, throw it in a journal, throw it somewhere. I'm just like, this is what I worked on. This is what I did. This is what the end result was. This is how I brought it to life. And if you can have, because recruiters love those ex experiences that you have. And if you can dictate very, very um, concisely, like what you did, uh, that, that, that's a huge, huge thing. Um, so I would say like, that's one thing, keep in your back pocket, just constantly look at that. And the other thing is it, it's such a key thing. Everyone always says, you know, there's sayings out there. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Networking is such a key word. And that is very important. But I think the most important part about it is being very um, sincere with it. And you're not just like reaching out to people to say like, hey, I just want to connect, blah, 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 blah. You, you meet people every day in your life. You have relationships you don't even realize. Um, as a high school kid, 
talk to your, your friend's parents. What do they do? What is their experiences? What are, what are, you know, what, what are their jobs? And, and just kind of keep that in the back of your mind or keep a list somewhere. Like what you're, you always know what like family and uncles and dads and that kind of stuff. But like, that's a little harder to get in the door, but like, it's those other parts of your life. Um, do you have coaches? Do you have teachers? Do you have community people that you, you know, like that to do other things outside that or have other experiences and connections? And those are really the connections that are going to get you to, to where you're going. I mean, I was very lucky to um, have a coach when I was in high school, Joe Mortimer, who I'm sure you, you remember, Phil, uh, who was someone who always pushed me to like go up from a very young age and talk to, you know, Adults at that time, but like talk to coaches, talk to different runners, talk to things, and just introduce yourself, talk about their experiences, what do they do, how do they get to be as good as they are. And I took that from the sports side and just used it in the business world of just, you know, just have these conversations with people that you know or have contact with, or like what their experiences are, kind of similar to what we're doing right now, but um, just kind of reaching out to people and just keeping those relationships because those connections are the things that are going to get you in the door at companies and, and, and different industries that, that you have interest in. Yeah. Uh, well said, Matt. Thank you. I, I think we can all, I'm a huge fan of networking agreed and you never know how you can help someone or someone can help you too. And being sincere about it is, is a great and valid point. So, well, Matt, uh, thank you so much. We're sending you health and happiness during these strange times. Uh, congratulations on all your success. And you are a D230 legend. I know you don't like talking about it much, but the runners know that name for sure. Uh, but thank you again for your time and uh, look forward to running into you in the virtual world and LinkedIn or something like that. But take care.